Good morning, guys and gals. How are you? Good. Let's bring your own table to church Sunday. Did you forget yours? Man. Are you really doing well? It's a beautiful day. It's going to be warm. We're all just counting down the minutes to get out there. Right? Yeah? Okay, I'll admit it, even if you aren't ready to admit it. Uh, my name is Buddy. I get to serve on staff here, and uh, it's my privilege to be able to oftentimes uh, be the teacher. And so today we are going to be continuing through a study that we've been in for so long that I can't remember. Someone asked me today, like, how long have we been in Matthew? And I don't know. It's been a while. Uh, we're starting chapter 18 today. So if you have your Bibles or a digital device, if you want to turn there, that would be absolutely fantastic. At the Holton household, we are excited. We got a handful of chicks. Anyone else raising chicks this spring? I, um, I say a lot of words. I like words. Uh, a word that I don't often say too, too frequently is the word cute. But baby chicks are downright cute. I've actually got one in my pocket. Uh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> You're like, what? Uh, but man, these chicks, they're like little, and they chirp or cheep or whatever noise you want to call that, they chirp. And they are just absolutely adorable. And if you've ever raised chicks, you know that they need a lot of help. They are innocent. They are helpless. They take a ton of care more than you would imagine. And within a few short weeks, they turn from just adorable little creatures into pretty ugly poultry. It's amazing, like, how quickly, like, there's just this short window when they're adorable, and then the next thing you know, you're like, yeah, I'd just rather eat you. And so um, that's how I feel about our animals. Today, we're going to be diving into um, Jesus' teaching. And Jesus, um, as I'm sure most of us are aware, had an awfully fond place in his heart for children. He talked about their innocence. He talked about their dependence, their helplessness. And we're going to dive into that and see how it might apply to us. I'm going to pray real quick, and then we're going to jump in. Lord, thank you so much that you are so good, so creative, so powerful. Lord, I, uh, as always, am just in awe at the seasons that you have created in this physical world. Thank you so much for the joy and the beauty and the warmth and just the bursting life that spring brings to North Idaho. Lord, I pray that uh, with the flowers popping up, with chicks abounding, and and all of the trees leafing out, Lord, that we would notice every aspect of the transformation of this physical world, and that we would see your handiwork and your power, and ultimately your love for us in the midst of all of that. God, as we teach through your word, I pray that it would be an act of worship. Lord, I I come to you today just tired and exhausted with a cold. I'm so aware of my uh, inabilities and my liabilities, and I pray that you would still use me, Lord, in my weakness, would your strength be made perfect. And I pray that our church, that we, Lord, would respond to you, that your spirit would be alive, that it would move us, that it wouldn't be my wise words, uh, if there are any, Lord, but it would be a movement of your spirit. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to jump in, Matthew 18, verse 1. It says, at that time. And so if you're with us last week, uh, we covered a couple of interesting things. The uh, transfiguration, which was pretty monumental, had just occurred. Jesus took um, kind of his three, what seemed to be favorites, Peter, James, and John, of the 12 disciples. They went up on a tall mountain. Jesus transfigured. He uh, went through this metamorphosis where he shone. He, his glory, in, in a way that human eyes can perceive, uh, illuminated the world. So these guys come back down, they come down to the din or the hubbub, the cacophony of this huge crowd with all of their needs, and Jesus performs this miracle, he frees this kid from demonic oppression, and then Jesus does this weird miracle that's just unparalleled in all of scripture, this this weird thing with Peter and paying some obscure temple tax, and Jesus telling Peter to go catch a fish that will apparently have money in its mouth, and it's only found in Matthew, Matthew the tax collector found it really interesting how Jesus Jesus procured the money to fund this tax that he owed. And it's interesting because it's the only miracle that Jesus performed that he benefited from. It's the only miracle Jesus performed that included only one fish. It's the only miracle Jesus performed that had anything to do with money. And it's the only miracle that Jesus pronounced would be performed that we don't actually read about the follow-through. We're not sure what happened. But we can pretty well understand that it's Jesus, so it probably came true. And so Peter has gone out, assumedly, and he has cast his his hook in line into the water. He's caught this fish. The fish almost miraculously has money in its mouth, which he uses to pay the temple for Peter's tax and for Jesus' tax. 
Can you imagine again what the rest of the disciples were thinking and feeling? For the other nine, they didn't see the transfiguration. They missed out. They had to deal with all of the issues of the regular world. And then for uh, the other 11 who are wondering, well, why does Peter get this cool miracle with Jesus? Well, why does he experience this and, and we don't? Why are we left out? And it said that at that time, with all of this going on, it says that Jesus' disciples came to him, and they asked him what seems to be uh, an innocent or innocuous question. And they said, Who, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And doesn't that seem pretty innocent? It's a good question to ask. They're curious about this kingdom that Jesus has come, that he is pronouncing, that he uh, is again and again, at least at this point, reminding his disciples of what his kingdom is and how it's different from this world and how it's going to unfold. And so it seems to be a fair question. So tell us, Jesus, more about uh, the culture of your kingdom. What, what's important? What makes someone great or not so great in your kingdom? That, it, it seems to be a wonderful question. But what they're actually asking is, which one of us is the greatest? And if we read in the parallel passages in uh, chapter 9 of both Luke and Mark, they cover this particular part of the story of Jesus. Luke says, an argument arose among the disciples as to which one of them was the greatest. So these guys are walking around with Jesus. Some of them have unique experiences. Some of them seem to be favored. Some of them, especially John, uh, spend most time with Jesus as compared to some of the others, and they began to argue, I'm better than you are. Jesus likes me more than Jesus likes you. It's, it's so childlike. And, and Mark goes even further. It, it is so uncomfortable in Mark. It says, when they arrived at Capernaum, when Jesus was in the house, he asked his disciples, hey, what were you guys discussing along the way? Because he knew. And it goes on, and he says, but they kept silent. They all just start kicking unseen pebbles on the ground and looking at their feet for some reason. It says, for Jesus know, knew that they had argued about which one of them would be the greatest in his kingdom. And so when these disciples in Matthew 18 come to Jesus, uh, it's not innocent. They're really saying, who's going to be greatest? Uh, asking for a friend, right? Like, I would never be the greatest. I get that. But, but these men are, are prideful. They're arrogant. They, they are boasting and bragging. They're jostling and fighting for positions. Our chickens um, are dumb. They're brainless. They're, they're just a bunch of feathers walking around, it seems like. Feather brain, bird brain is, is the term we use to, to talk about someone who, uh, who just doesn't have much as far as intellect. And it's interesting that these baby chicks that we're raising, they're adorable, they're cute, they're getting along fine. Uh, in two months, they'll be trying to kill each other. They will all be fighting for supremacy, like literally working out a pecking order is what they will be doing. They all want to be the mother hen, and then they'll shuffle out who's the greatest all along down the line to the least. And this is exactly what we human beings do. It is incredible how much mental capacity, how much time, how much of our life and our finances are spent trying to be better. Better than I was, better than you are, better than my parents were, better than the rest of the world is. And it is so funny to poke fun at these disciples. What a bunch of imbeciles arguing with an earshot of the almighty God as to which human being is best. It's incredible, but it's so convicting to recognize that we as human beings in general, and we as Americans especially, are so fixated upon the newest, the best, the, the latest, the greatest, the fastest. How, how much of your life, just this last seven days, was spent trying to get more, to accumulate more, to be better, to, to, to get another step of the rung in life and in this race to the top. This is what most of us spend most of our time fixating upon when we're not intentional about our thought life. And so Jesus responds to the disciples. He says, and calling to him a little child, he put his, this child in the midst of them, and he begins to teach them. This word child is interesting. There are different words for children as we have. Um, it's not just someone's child. Uh, it's not an adolescent. It's not a teen. That This particular word referred to really little dependent children, generally aged seven or younger. And so Jesus grabs this really little kid, someone who's innocent, someone who is unaware of the jostle and the hubbub and the rat race of this world. Mark goes so far as saying that Jesus even wrapped his arms around this kid as he begins to illustrate to his disciples what he's about to say. And so Jesus says this, Truly. Whenever Jesus says truly, that means he's really serious. 
He is emphatic that this is the strongest language that he can invoke so that you need to recognize, like shake yourself out of the stupor. Jesus, he's pretty fired up at the moment. So truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like these little kids, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Have you ever um, had a smackdown in your life where you're feeling pretty good and then someone just brings down the hammer on you? Generally when you're a kid and you feel like you're getting away with something, you're awesome, and then the next thing you know, you're grounded for the rest of your life? No? Okay. My kids don't know what that means either. Um, But this is exactly what's going on. I mean, these men have literally gone in in their mind's eye from thinking, what position in Jesus' government will I have? How much of the world do you suppose I will personally rule over once Jesus is king supreme? And Jesus has come to them, and recognizing the attitude of their heart, Jesus does what he always does. He doesn't really answer their question. Have you ever noticed that in the Bible? When Jesus answers questions, he never answers the actual question, but the question behind the question. And so Jesus does that with these guys. He's he's not even going to answer which one of them is the greatest. He actually says, you guys are all liable for being prohibited from this kingdom. Forget who's greatest at the moment with this attitude of heart that you've adopted, you're not even a citizen of the kingdom. That, that should scare you. That, that should, that should lull you, uh, wake you from your lull. Like, that this is important. That Jesus uses his interesting words, turn and become like children. In light of this transformation, the transfiguration that Jesus has just done, I'm sure that at least the three who noticed it and who witnessed it uh, were pretty bewildered still at this point. Jesus uses similar transitionary words, transformative words. Unless you turn, unless you deviate course and and make a radical course adjustment, unless you become, and that word become means to emerge or transition or to change condition, unless you do something different, you're on a collision course for expulsion from the kingdom of God. This is to the 12 apostles, the fathers of the church. Jesus is communicating this so strongly. If he's talking so bluntly to the 12 who would do miracles, who would plant churches, who would literally raise people from the dead, how much more should these words be important to us disciples today? What attitude do we have when we approach Jesus? Is it oftentimes gratitude and thankfulness personally, privately between our God. We confess our sins. He knows how dirty we can feel, and we cleanse ourselves through confession and receiving, again, the grace of God by which we live. But then we go out into the world, and we know we're forgiven, and and we know we're right with God, and we know we're being saved from the madness of this world at some point. But the rest of the world, we know we're greater than they are. We understand that there's a superiority that, that we get to flaunt it. My life is better I live at more peace. I, I don't have to suffer the crises of life that sin brings to most of the people in our community. And oftentimes, we find ourselves, whether we're literally arguing about it or not, uh, adopting the same attitude that these disciples did. I bet I'm better than you are. I bet I'm more godly than you are. And, and it's just uh, springing forth from what we would consider the American way of, of more and better and greater. And, and this is exactly what we adopt with our spirituality. And Jesus is just calling it out and saying, listen, that's, that's actually the antithesis. That's, that's not only missing the point. If, if you want to be best, if you want to be greatest, if, if you're all about the race to the top, you need to understand that's actually actively fighting against the cultural kingdom of Jesus Christ. So not only is it just neutral, but it's actually destroying what Jesus came to create. He continues on and he says, whoever humbles himself like this little child, it is he who will be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Can you imagine just the awkward silence at this point? Like, what would the 12 say? Like, oh, gee. Wait, so is it me? Right? Like, do you think they're giving up at this point? Do you think they're still trying to hold on to this? Uh, They're not understanding the gravity of Jesus' mission. It's it's not about a worldly regime in, in Israel. It's about global salvation, the opportunity to be freed from sin and death. And and they're just missing the point of Jesus and his kingdom. And how often do, do we do the same thing? 
we oftentimes just include Jesus. We, we drag him along like he's a puppy dog, like it's me and Jesus, and, and he makes me happy when I feel lonely and sad. But, but do we recognize that that's, that's not the gospel that Jesus came to pronounce to us? Jesus came and said, no, if, if you want Jesus, if, if you want admittance into this kingdom, if, if you ever hope uh, to, to matter, to make a difference, to have significance, but, but in the ways of Jesus, then it's, it's not a race to the top. It's actually a race to the bottom. It's, it's humility. It's, it's weakness. It's, it's utter dependence upon someone else for, for your needs. And that, that is miraculous. That's why Jesus is communicating these words of, as transformative, of turning and, and, and transitioning and becoming, because that's not something that we naturally do. This isn't a matter of will. This is a matter of supernatural, miraculous salvation that is required. I love Philippians 2. Philippians 2 talks about this attitude of Jesus. And throughout this Gospel of Matthew, personally at least, almost every single week, I end up reading this particular passage about Jesus, the, the attitude, the condition that Jesus adopted so that he could minister to me. And in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, Paul is communicating to a church in a city named Philippi, and he's communicating to these early believers, and he tells them, do nothing, don't do a single thing from selfish ambition or from your vain conceit. If we just had those two rules in America, can you imagine how much our culture would transform instantaneously? Okay, whatever you do this week, with your money, with your time, with, with all that you are, just make sure two things. Nothing is done to make you look better, and nothing is done to get you more in this life. That would transform our nation instantaneously. And he continues on, and he says, but... In humility, using the same word here, in this lowliness, consider others more significant than yourselves. Man, that's hard. That's not natural to my heart. That's not where my mind goes instantly. We are, we're exactly the opposite. We, we, we judge people all the time, whether, whether it's through their vocabulary, their syntax, their car that they rode here in, the job that they do. And at least for me, for socially awkward people and introverts like me, like one of the few things that I know to say to new people is like, hey, uh, what do you do? Right? Because we want to judge you. What, where are you at? What's your education level? What's your income? What, where do you fit in the strata of, of American society? And, and all that we do is, is a, a placing, a pecking order, so we can figure out uh, who we are better than and who we need to catch up to. And Scripture is saying, no, no. You're playing the wrong game. You're, you're running in the wrong direction. This, this race towards Jesus is not a race to the top. It's a race to the bottom. It's, it's humility. It's giving up yourself and, and promoting others even when you have the opportunity to promote yourself. Continuing on, he says, let each of you look not only to your own interests, but, but make sure to also look towards the interests of others. In verse 5 in Philippians 2, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours. Jesus has given you this. It's yours through Jesus Christ. And speaking of Jesus Christ, who... Though he was in the form of God, even Jesus didn't count equality with God, something to be grasped, something to fight for, something to work at. Jesus, he, he gave up that game, but rather he emptied himself, and he took the form of a servant. And Jesus, the Lord God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, he was born into the likeness of human beings. And being found in human form, he humbled himself. The same word that Jesus is commanding his disciples to do. Not just the original 12, but if you follow Jesus, you are a disciple. This command is for you. Jesus humbled himself as he has commanded us to do, and he became obedient to the point of death, even the miserable, humiliating death of a cross. And so Jesus won. If you want to know who's greatest in the kingdom, who's most humble, quite obviously it's our King Jesus. He's our model, our, our archetype, our prototype. Like if, if you want to look towards where you need to be, what you're aiming at, where your energy needs to go, what your model is, it's, it's not this world. It's not these games. It's not getting more things. It's a divestment of this world. It's a placing yourself last again and again and again, a dying to self, an emptying, not a becoming more, but but in real ways of becoming less so that Jesus can be made more. 
And, and Paul concludes with, with the profound blessing that Jesus received because of this. Therefore, because Jesus Christ humbled himself for my sake and for your sake, God the Father has highly exalted our Jesus. He has bestowed upon Jesus the name that is above every single name, so that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess on earth and under earth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. When I read this idea of the disciples, I get it. I'm competitive. I want to be best. I want my life to matter. I want to make a difference in this world. But the ways that I naturally gravitate to fulfill those felt needs are so self-destructive. They're so selfish. It converts people like you into my obstacles, my, my opposition. And Jesus is saying that's, that's, that's not the culture that he died so that I could receive. Jesus is communicating to these 12 boneheads and to me. No, it's, it's a race to the bottom. If you want your life to matter, then give it up. If you want to make a difference, then make a difference in others' lives. If, if you want a kingdom and if you want riches, then make sure that they're eternal and not temporal in this world. And Jesus ultimately uses this little kid as an example of one who, who's too young to play the game, too naive to understand the nuances of this world, too dependent upon others to try to get his own things. And Jesus says, become like this child. Whoever humbles himself like this child, they will be the great ones in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Verse 5 continues, and he says, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. That doesn't mean you get to be religious and creepy. Come here, little children, in the name of Jesus, right? Like, no, that's not, that's not really cool anymore, or ever, really. Uh, Jesus is communicating. When it says, in my name, it's, it's in the cause of Christ, with the authority of Jesus, in, in the same manner that Jesus uh, revealed to us, receive kids. Like, just literal kids are important to Jesus, they're innocent, they're fragile, they're meaningful in his kingdom. And, and also in the context, like Jesus is clearly speaking of believers. Believers who love Jesus and who are living for him and who make much of him and less of themselves. Like Receive them in Jesus' name. There, there should be familiarity between we who live in Jesus' culture. Jesus' kids should get along. We should recognize one another as assets and, and not as opposition. And so he says, receive them, and if you do so in my name, you, you are receiving me in essence. But whoever causes one of these little ones to sin, it would be better for him to have a millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Do you ever believe like Jesus says stuff like that? Jesus is like, no, literally, you'd be better off to drown yourself. You're like, no, Jesus, that can't be in the Bible. These millstones were interesting. They, um, they were basically like the size of a pickup truck tire, uh, like in all dimensions. And they would roll around on each other, and they would grind up the grain or the cereals so that these people could have wheat and make bread. And so they would weigh anywhere from hundreds to thousands of pounds. And Jesus is literally like, hey, if, if your lifestyle of the race to the top leaves a wake of destruction... If your self-centeredness comes at the cost of other people's feelings and their health and their safety and especially of their spiritual well-being, then you need to understand Jesus says you'd be literally better to drown yourself. Just in it. That, that this, this is important. This is serious. There's, there's obviously like gravity to these words. Like clearly, Jesus is not advocating self-harm. What he's trying to communicate to us is how important it is that we work together towards the kingdom of Jesus. To communicate culturally what's important for Jesus is that we work with one another to race towards the model of Jesus as opposed to fighting one another on our race to the top. And so he uses this word, uh, whoever causes one to sin. That's what the ESV says, which I happen to be teaching out of. The original word there is scandalon. It's where we get the English word uh, scandal from. Uh, and it actually referred to something that would be akin to what, what we have as like a, a general idea of a bear trap, right? Those two jaws with that little thing in the middle. And if you step in the middle, the jaws clamp on you. Yes, blank stares. Anyone tracking at all? Have you watched any cartoons? Okay, yes. 
There's either a bear trap or a, just a circular bomb, okay? That's all I learned from the Roadrunner. And so this idea, this like literally this word scandalon was that little trigger in the middle of a bear trap. That's literally what this means, the trigger for a snare or for a trap. And so Jesus is communicating, hey, if that's your life, if your attitude, if your actions, if the things you live for, if the posts that you make on social media, if the, the, the arrogance of your attitude causes a brother or sister in Jesus to, to get snapped up in sin, Woe to you. You had, better, you had better be scared because you are jeopardizing the well-being of one of the beloved children of Jesus Christ. That there's gravity to that. It's just not, I'll do me. I've got my autonomy. I'll do whatever I want. Don't tell me what to do. I'll just do me. And the scripture is saying, no, that's not how this works at all. Watch out for one another. Care for the well-being of one another. We're in this together. We succeed as a group, not as individuals. Continuing on. Verse 7, woe to the world. This is like the dark side of joy to the world, right? Like no one wants to sing this at Christmas. Although I think you could write a pretty catchy tune. But anyway, woe to the world. This word woe, uh, it just means um, a warning. It, it's, it's either used in grief or in denunciation. Obviously, Jesus is condemning something right now. Woe to the world for temptations. Again, that word scandal on. Woe to the wor- world for things that trip us up, that, 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 that entice us towards ungodliness. For it is necessary that temptations come. That word necessary is not like Jesus is promoting sin. That word means inevitable. Sin's going to happen. People do godless things all the time. There will be trip-ups all around in our world. We, we know that, right? In the workplace, in the educational spots, obviously online, there's all sorts of terrible things waiting for us. And Jesus is communicating. He understands that. He knows that we live in a world that is just wrought with all sorts of traps and temptations. And woe to the world for that. It's inevitable that they will come, but woe to the one by whom those temptations come. A moment of self-reflection. What what about you? What about your life? What about the way you conduct yourself when you're outside of Christian circles? How do you behave to the people who are under you at work? What's your attitude to those above you at work? What about your leisure time? What about that browsing history that you erased and you don't want anybody to know? What about your life? Are are you doing things that are ungodly, that, that could trip people up in their pursuit of Jesus Christ? We need to take that more seriously, church. And so he says, woe to you. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It will be better for you to enter life crippled or lame with, than with two hands or two feet and to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. The trash cans are in the back. <laughs> no, okay. Jesus concludes, it would be better for you to enter life, and by this he's quite clearly meaning eternal life abundant. It would be better for you to enter life with one eye than to be with two eyes thrown into the hell of fire. Again and again, I need to communicate, Jesus is not advocating self-harm. The problem with taking Jesus literally here, surprisingly, is cutting off your hand to mitigate sin. Honestly, just it doesn't go far enough. Because you can still sin with the other hand. And if you have no hands, you still have a motivation in your heart, a brokenness to sin, a bent towards that. And so Jesus is communicating not that we would literally maim ourselves physically, but that we need to take sin very, very, very seriously. And quite frankly, church, we don't. We promote a Jesus of grace and of love and forgiveness, and all of that is true, but it is blown into epic proportions at the expense of righteousness and obedience, and a God who literally tells us he hates sin, but we'd prefer just to focus on his grace because we know we're going to go do it again tomorrow. And Jesus is communicating that's, that's not okay. Just because all of us are doing it all the time doesn't make God hate sin any less. Like, we need to recognize, we need to be ruthless in our elimination of this stuff from our lives to the point where we need to take it as seriously as if we were to cut off limbs of our body, that that would be the passion, the the hunger in our lives for obedience, for righteousness, for, for a holiness that our God lives in and that we can't by ourselves maintain. But this is why Jesus came, so that through his power and in his grace and with the guidance of his spirit, we may live the way that he desires us to. 
And with all of these resources at our fingertips as children of Jesus Christ, we are without excuse with our continued lackadaisical attitude of sin. And Jesus just calls it out. You guys think you're awesome? You think you're doing really well in God's kingdom? Listen, disciples, at the moment, I'm not sure if you're in the kingdom. And furthermore, this this attitude, this disgusting sin in your life, you need to take it seriously. It's not like, oh, boys will be boys, and they're fighting for the top, and those silly disciples just wanted to know who's best. (laughs) This is grotesque in the eyes of our Christ, and he needs these men and us to understand that. Finishing up this last paragraph, he says, See to it that you do not despise these little ones. Recognize that there needs to be a different kind of culture than, than a wary glance and than wondering what people's angle or their bent is or what they want out of you. This isn't a game that we're playing here, but we need to recognize instead of despising one another, which is a worldly way, the kingdom side of things is we love one another. We bear with one another. I look towards your good. I live my life in surrender and submission so that I can promote your spiritual well-being. And Jesus commands you to do the same for me. For I tell you that in heaven their angels will always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Literally the verse that people get guardian angels from. Because there's no other verse that talks about guardian angels. It's crazy. Guardian angels are like a huge pet peeve of mine, and I have like 10,000 pet peeves. But people are like, oh, you're guardian angels. Make sure that you're going slow so your guardian angel can keep up to you. I'm like, wow. I literally don't understand what that means. Like, I, I don't know. But what clearly Jesus is communicating is not some huge teaching on angels and guardian angels, but rather God cares about you that he cares, he's, he's involved, these angels, they have his ear, they have his attention, he's, he's paying attention to you, he cares that you are doing well. And so pay attention, don't despise these little ones. Jesus concludes uh, with what is sort of a parable. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep, and just one of them goes astray, that word means deviate, to wonder. Um, the, um, the actual word there is planeo, it's literally where we get our word planet. Planet means a wandering body, something that's wandering through outer space. And so Jesus uses that word. Imagine you have a hundred sheep and one of them is a wandering body. It just, it wanders off. I'm saying wander, really weird. I don't know why. Does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and does not the shepherd go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, the shepherd rejoices over this one lost sheep more than the 99 who never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father in heaven that one of these little children should perish. That love that Jesus is communicating about has led me to Jesus Christ. If you were a child of Jesus, you were that one at one point. How how incredible is that? How can you hear those words and not be moved emotionally that, that the God who created the universe, he sought you, he loved you at your worst, He was willing to forgive you, knowing full well your lifespan worth of sin. He delights in you. He wants you to be in good relationship with him. That is why he sent Christ as our sacrifice for those sins. And if we receive this grace and this love, if we have been adopted into the fold of the good shepherd, how should that change the way that we not only view one another, but the way we view this world? One of our hopes as a staff for this church is that we will just literally be the greatest place on earth. I mean, why shouldn't a church be the greatest place on earth? That's not something that that I as a pastor can do. Like, this is incumbent upon all of us. If you're here, our hope for you is that we create real community. That's one of the reasons why church staffs are just so annoyed at people who sneak in late and leave early because you're missing out on the beauty of church. The church isn't this service. Church is being a people set apart for Jesus Christ. Church is being part of a community that lives for a kingdom culture rather than a worldly regime. And if if you attend, our hope for you is that you will be relationally connected. This is why we promote activities. This is why we do retreats. This is why we do craft nights. This is why we promote home groups, not so that we look busy, but so we can create community. We can learn from one another. We can be loved by one another. We can be accountable to one another. This is what makes Christianity different than the culture of this world, that we recognize that there's something in us that is redeemed by the Lord. I can learn from you. 
I can be encouraged from you. Hopefully, I'm an encouragement to you as well. This is flying in the face of the attitude that started this whole talk. Who's best? Am I better than you? How do we stack up? Jesus concludes by saying, no. No, you're only in the presence of God because God loved you. He sought you out when you didn't deserve it. You were were actively running away from him when he found you. And with that love that you have received, well, why wouldn't church be a loving place? Why wouldn't you get over yourself and try to build relationships? Why wouldn't you recognize that, that there's so much more than just mere attendance? There is a belonging. There is a participation. There, there is a serving with one another. There is a mission that Christ has given us that now we who have been found, we get the incredible joy of helping Jesus find others. He can use us to save people from darkness and from these fires of hell that Jesus took very seriously and very literally. What is holding us back, church, from living this life that Christ died so that we could live? My prayer for us, my conviction this week personally as studying this is, where am I being judgmental towards people that I I just shouldn't be? What areas in my life have I allowed sin to creep in And frankly, I'm okay with it. What am I actively doing to ruthlessly eliminate sin that God so vehemently hates? And how am I doing loving you guys? How are we doing loving our community that needs to see real love? Not Bible bashing, not spiritual arrogance, not a cold disregard and a stiff hand to the world to stay out of our lives but a love that pursues and that seeks even to our own detriment. This is what Jesus did for us, and this is what he is calling us to do for such a time as this. Would you guys stand with me? The bummer thing with my chickens is I've got like seven days before they're the most hideous things in the world. (laughs) Uh, Watching a chick feather out, it's horrible. They're hopeless. But the cool thing for us in Jesus Christ is he's saying in this race to the bottom, there is this supernatural transformative power of the almighty God. And even if you don't believe that you can become these things, that's okay. Because Jesus believes it and he has the power to transform you, to turn you, to, to change your condition so that we can become innocent, dependent, free of the baggage of sin, abstaining from the wicked games of this world and promoting the culture of the kingdom of Jesus Christ in Kootenai County. Man, let's pray that Jesus will help us to do that. Lord, thank you so much, as always, obviously for Jesus. Lord, the way that you have communicated your love and your compassion for me, for us, is astounding. Lord, you deserve our worship and our praise for all of eternity for what you have done. Lord, would that motivate us? Would you convict us of our sins, Lord Jesus Christ? Would you help us to confess them to you and to one another and to be free from the things that entangle us from running the race that you have set out for us? Lord, would you create us into a community of faith, not a service, not a cool bumper sticker that reps where we go, but that we would belong, that we would personally invest into this community of faith that you have placed us in. Lord, we'll be the first to admit that we we are so weak, we are so helpless, we are so broken, we desperately need you if this is gonna happen. And so we count on you, Lord Jesus. We submit ourselves to you. Would you do the transforming? Would you do the changing? Would you make us into the children you want us to be? And would you please use us, Lord, to seek and to save those who are lost in our lives. We pray this in your name. Amen. Church, thank you so much for being with us. If you are new, we would love to get to know you, either through that texting or in the Connect booth. Otherwise, have an awesome day. Thank you. Broken by the day.